Nephilim Watchers and Enoch. Oh boy! <laughs> this you will call a continuation, if you will, of um, the previous video, um, The Lost Tribes. In that video, The Lost Tribes, I made an error in that video. In that video, I attributed to Goliath as the one having six fingers and six toes, uh, six fingers on each hand and six toes. The scriptures does not say that it was Goliath that had six fingers and six toes. We cannot assume that Goliath, that he had six fingers and six toes. We cannot assume that. That was an error, a mistake on my part for saying that. Please forgive me of that error. That was I was wrong about that. Uh, please forgive me. I repent of that. And thank you if you do. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong. This video came about, and that information about um, the uh, six finger thing and six toes that uh, I had got that wrong. Thank you, Lord. He showed me that. Came about upon this subject that we are going to be talking about. Nephilim, Watchers, and Enoch. Oh boy. Oh boy. First of all, we're going to be in the scriptures today. You can see this. We're going to get to this in a second. But uh, please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And follow me along in the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Okay? Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse at the scripture we are going to be looking at, okay? Quit counting on these so-called experts or these um, esoteric people to provide for you truth, okay? Be a Berean. Search the scriptures yourself. Search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. Okay? Follow me along. Check me out. Keep me accountable. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Okay? We're going to begin in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 on to verse 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. 2 Peter chapter 1, 19 on to verse 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private, unknown, hidden interpretation. That you gotta go take a certain uh, course in order to learn what the scriptures say. That you gotta buy a certain book written by a man in order to really grasp what scripture is saying. If you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you are sealed unto the day of redemption, once saved, always saved. You have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God our Father, dwelling within you. And the Spirit of truth, and the Lord is that Spirit, He will guide you into all truth. Okay? He will guide you into all truth. But this thing about the private interpretation, we've, we've addressed this before. This is what this basically gets around to. Okay? Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this whole thing about the Nephilim, Watchers and Enoch, go oh on, comes about through things that are considered apocryphal. Apocryphal. What does the word apocrypha mean? Okay, I'm going to put the scriptures aside for right now. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay. I recommend you use Webster's 1828 Dictionary, yes. But when it comes to pure definition of words found in Scripture, 
Use the scriptures first. Use Webster's as a last resort when it comes to defining words in scripture. Okay? But otherwise, okay, what does the word apocryphal mean? Apocrypha. Okay? Be cautious of the Webster's 1828 online. They did something to it. They did. They, they messed with it. There was a little time where Webster's 1828 dictionary, what's that? Went offline for a while and then it came back. And the stuff that you can get online, there's stuff that's online that is not in the printed edition. Be aware of that. I used to have a link for Webster's 1828 Dictionary online on the channel. I took it down because of that. Uh, what was it? Um, and our brother from Croatia was the one who uh, inadvertently, I think, pointed this out. Uh, check out the word speed in the printed edition of the 1828 versus the online edition. You'll see what I'm talking about. But Apocrypha, as defined by Webster's 1828 Dictionary, noun. Literally such things as are not published, but in an appropriate sense, books whose authors are not known, whose authenticity as inspired writings is not admitted, and which are, and which are therefore not considered a part of the sacred canon of the scripture. When the Jews publish their sacred books, the Jews... And right here we go again with, well, what is a Jew? Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. Jews, like we talked about in length in the previous video. Jews, scripturally, are Hebrews. Hebrews come from the tribe of Shem, taken out of the tribe of Shem. Not Ham, not Japheth. Okay, and the fathers of the Hebraic line are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, enough on that. But the Jews, okay, uh, when the Jews published their sacred books, they called them canonical and divine. And that's important because, uh, as we have read in the previous video, in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The law were given unto the Jew, the Hebraic people, as were the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures. Okay? All right? They were given unto the Jew. Not the Greek not the uh, those in Alexandria who, uh, long after the death of Jesus Christ, wrote that ridiculous Septuagint. Okay, Jesus Christ, God our Father, did not use the Septuagint. That is a papist Roman Catholic lie. Okay. Yeah, your 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 scholars, your scholars. Yeah, the scholars are trained by the Jesuits. Yeah, who are masters of yea hath God said. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's, but let, let's, let's continue here, okay? When the Jews published their sacred books, they called them canonical and divine, such as they did not publish, were called apocryphal. Right here. The apocryphal books are received by the Romish church as canonical, but not by Protestants. Apocryphal, adjective, pertaining to the apocrypha, not canonical, of uncertain authority or credit, false, fictitious. Uh, apocryphally, adverb, uncertainly, uncertainly, nor indisputably. Apocryphalness, noun, uncertainty, 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 as to authenticity, uh, as to authenticity, doubtfulness of credit or genuineness. That's what apocrypha means, and apocryphal and its uh, derivatives there, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary. Okay, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary, and the apocrypha. Now, to get this out of the way, 
This edition of the authorized version of the scriptures has the Apocrypha in it. Okay, the Apocrypha, even in the 1611, the original uh, 1611, and if you have a facsimile copy of it, which I believe everyone in the Church of the Living God needs to have, okay, or should have, excuse me, should have, uh, the Apocrypha is between the two Testaments, okay? And the Apocryphal books are not inspired scripture, okay? And, when, for example... The apocryphal books such as Ezra or whatever. Well, 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 let me look at it. Okay, hold on. All right. This set of scriptures, by the way, was given to me as a gift. This very expensive copy of the scriptures, this Cambridge Cameo Edition, was generously, graciously given on to me as a gift. And, um, yeah, so. But, like, in Esdras, okay, there's first and second Esdras, which is uh, Latin, I believe, for Ezra. And if you read uh, Esdras, it's about Ezra, okay? And see, what is in the book of Esdras contradicts both Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? And then when you, and also, you have the comical book of Tobit. Uh, Tobit's an amusing, amuse, amuse, not the thing. Uh, Tobit is an amusing book. This poor guy has a pigeon poop in his eyes. Then he sends his son's off, his son off to go get some kind of fortune or something, and then this guy runs into an angel, and this angel recommends on to Tobit about using witchcraft. Divination, magic, warning, okay? So, yeah, but, I mean, Tobit's, uh, Tobit's actually kind of humorous. Poor guy gets uh, pigeon poop in his eyes. Then you got Judith, which is a feminist uh, uh greatest book, I would say, because in Judith, this lady, uh, excuse me, this woman, kind of infiltrates and acts as an assassin and then lops off some guy's head. Okay, Judith is... <laughs> then we have the Wisdom of Solomon, which is also kind of interesting, but is rambling. And, you know, there's no proof that Solomon his, himself wrote that. Okay? It's interesting, but it's, it's lacking. Because it's not divinely inspired. And then you have the editions of the book of Esther. And personally, this is what did it for me about the Apocrypha. And the book of Esther, as found in the authorized version of the scriptures, and even in a Bible, okay, the word God does not appear at all. Doesn't appear at all. Okay? Not once. But within the um, additions to the book of Esther, in the very first verse, then Mardachius said, God hath done these things. <laughs> because in Esther chapter 10, verse 3, it stops. And this picks up at 4. And then right away in the very first verse, it says the word, the, the name God. So what's wrong with that? The book of Esther doesn't have the name, the word God at all in it for a reason. And then Esther, the very first in this, the very first verse in the edition has God in it. That blew it for me about the Apocrypha. Okay. Then you have Bell and the Dragon. Uh, and the thing about the three children, uh, that thing about Daniel, where he basically gives a meatball to a dragon and the dragon whoop, blows up, basically. Okay, uh, and then you have the book of Ecclesiasticus, Sirach, son of Jesus, or whatever. And in Ecclesiasticus, if you would read that, you find a lot of Catholic doctrine within the book of Ecclesiasticus. 
See, a lot of Catholic doctrine is contained in the Apocrypha. Why do you think they have it in it? Why do they? you think, like here in their Revised Standard Version here, why do you think they have the Apocrypha? Because the Romish Papist Catholic doctrines are primarily found in the Apocrypha. And when you read the Apocrypha, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, excuse me, and the other books, you will find glaring, blaring contradiction with the text of Scripture. Okay? You will. You will. And of course, there is 1st, 2nd, and even in some, 3rd and 4th, but 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And when you ask a learned Catholic of their doctrine about purgatory and whatnot, uh, some will go to 1st Corinthians, uh, what is it, chapter 3, where Paul talks about rewards. Okay, but most of the time, they turn you to the book of Maccabees. And the doctrine within the book of Maccabees also contradicts. And also, there is a guy who dies three separate times in the book of Maccabees. Some will argue, well, that's a title given on to them. Uh, no, when you read the book of Maccabees, this one dude dies three times. Uh, he was having a pretty bad day, <laughs> or a pretty bad month, or year. Okay, the Apocrypha is interesting. It is. It is not inspired scripture. And when you consider that a majority of the Catholic doctrine comes from the Apocrypha, warning, warning. And also, too, now we talk about, we shift gears about the book of Enoch. And also with these other apocryphal books, you have what? The Book of Thomas, the uh, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, uh, the Book of Noah, the, the, the Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, you have all these other apocryphal books. And But when it comes specifically to the Book of Enoch, this, from this book, now this is also a very interesting read. But the book of Enoch, and incidentally, incidentally, I forgot to mention this. Incidentally, there are several versions of the book of Enoch. And you know, in the apocryphal books uh, here that are sandwiched between the Testaments within the authorized version of the scriptures, differ, the apocrypha in this, uh, that is sandwiched between the two actual Testaments of scripture, with the Apocrypha in this, the RSV, they differ. And from the Revised Standard Version, they also remove verses out of some of the Apocryphal books. And you look in the new Revised Standard Version that you can get today and compare it with something like from the 1611, they remove verses. <laughs> yeah, and that's something. And that's something. But... There are those, there, when you look into the book of Enoch, um, and here even in the back of this it says that the early church fathers considered this canonical. But Christians, from what was that, 364? 364, isn't that around the year when the Roman Catholic Church came up with the Christ Mass Doctrine! Hmm. Around that time, huh? Yeah. But they'll say, well, this, the book of Enoch, was originally considered as part of the Bible. And it was removed from the Bible. Hmm. Yea, hath God said. The book of Enoch contradicts with doctrine that is found with... See, and that's, that's the thing, there, brethren. That's the thing. Apocryphal books contradict with the canon of scripture. And let's look, uh, as far as what is the canon, and see people like, well, men decided what went in. Well, we read in First Peter about uh, how they were moved by the, uh, what is that? Uh, Second Peter, excuse me. Uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that spirit. The Lord's hand was on the creation of the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? 
And you might say, well, the Apocrypha was in the 1611. Sandwiched in between the two testaments and therefore reference not as inspired scripture. Have you ever read the epistle ded dedicatory of the authorized version of the scripture? Okay, have you ever? All right, but uh, go to Luke chapter 24. I know we're looking at this. We'll, we'll get to this. We have to go through this first, okay? And besides, it might do you some, don't do some of you well knowing that you can only see that much of me, okay? <laughs> but Luke chapter 24, verse 27. You know, on the road to Emmaus, when our Lord Jesus Christ came upon two people, who the two people were not allowed to know or see that it was actually the Lord talking with him, with them. Interesting. Because he didn't open their eyes to that yet. But, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, the first five books of Moses, the Torah, they, some call it the Pentateuch. I refer to it as the Torah. Okay? First five books. Torah nor Pentateuch is not in Scripture. Okay? Let's get that out of the way. But uh, the first five books. Okay? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. And let's look a little bit at the, at the canon of Scripture. Uh, skip over to verses 44 on to verse 45 in um, Luke chapter 24. And he said unto them, this is Jesus talking, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Okay? Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Hmm. And see, the Holy Ghost moved those who gave us the authorized version of the scriptures. The Lord gave us the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? He gave us this in English to be translated into other languages. Okay? And the canon of scripture was set by God not the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church gives us doctrine about what? Purgatory, praying for the dead, alms and makes an atonement for sin that the, you Christians, Catholics, you're going to go through the great tribulation no assurance of salvation and they gave us the Bible oh excuse me they did give you guys Catholicism did give you the Bible, yes. But God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit, gave us the Scriptures. So yes, Catholicism gave you a Bible, but God gave you the Scriptures, okay? But uh, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, of course. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want verses 16, not first, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, what is scripture? Uh, yea, hath God, yea, hath God said if, you know, there are many incidences of where people will utilize the satanic doctrine of, yea, hath God said. But when it comes to stuff like the apocryphal books that are out there, that's a blaring, yea, hath God said, if there ever was one. Okay? The apocryphal books, while well, are interesting to read. They're not inspired scripture. They're not. Because the apocryphal books that you will look into contradict the canon of what is inspired. Every time, in one way or another. The book of Enoch is no exception. It contradicts scripture. Doesn't add to it. Doesn't help it. Okay? And about that, go to Jude. Go to Jude. 
Jude. Okay, Jude. Then we'll get to this, because this is kind of getting on my nerves looking at it. Jude, verses 14 and 15. And in the book of Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of the... Wait a second. You, you caught that, right? And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. And that is almost word for word found within the book of Enoch, depending on if you got one written in the type of uh, language that the authorized version is found in. But it's almost, um, which also is a warning to you that the book of Enoch is not inspired scripture. And also you got mentioned in scripture the book of Jazir, right? And the prayer of Manasseh. The prayer of Manasseh, which is in the Apocrypha, is actually, when you read the prayer of Manasseh found in the Apocrypha, that is an actually very good prayer of repentance. It really is, yes. But see, it's not inspired scripture. It is spoken, worded, written in a form as if the uh, Lord Jesus Christ had been incarnated in the Old Testament. Even though he was in the Old Testament. Okay, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh in the New Testament. Okay? God manifest in the flesh. He would come and go. He would appear, but not be, not tabernacle, not be among his creation as he was in the flesh. See? But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, and it is from the book of Enoch. It is from the book of Enoch where a lot of these people with this Silly, and I'm trying to be polite, silly, stupid, last days nonsense that a lot of people will want to come up with. And they throw the thing of Nephilim around and Watchers, which both Nephilim and Watchers are spoken about in the book of Enoch. Okay? And Enoch is not inspired scripture. Okay? All right? But... People seem to want to go, some people want to go to the book of Enoch to try to um, interpret last day's things. And you got to remember about the book of Revelation. It's not written for us. Excuse me. It's not written to us. It's written for us. Yes, it is. But it's not written to us. Okay? We who are genuinely saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God, we're, we're out of here uh, by Revelation chapter 4, okay, where it says, Come up hither. We're out of here, okay? For instruction and in righteousness about the seven churches, yes, you can interpret that into certain types of people. Yes, you can. For instruction and in righteousness sake, yes. But doctrinally, the book of Revelation is not written to us today. It's written for the Jewish people, the Hebraic people, who are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? We today are not going to have a full understanding of the book of Revelation because it's not written to us, okay? And hence, people will go outside of the scriptures to try to define what the scriptures say in the book of Revelation. And it's always about that. And this is where, and incidentally, this word, Nephilim, does not appear in Webster's 1828 Dictionary and also does not appear in this Webster's New World Collegiate Dictionary of 1997, I believe this is. I believe 1997 or 1998, okay? It doesn't even appear in this. I would bet you if you were to get a Webster's Dictionary of today, which has the definition of the Simpson word, don't, in it, uh, yeah, today's dictionary might have Nephilim in it. 
But as far as 1997 and 98, Nephilim was not in, it's not in this dictionary. Okay? It's not. All right? I had to go on this. And this website is kind of iffy, but uh, they got some pretty decent information on this. But Nephilim. Now let's go through this so we can get this off of here and get to work. Nephilim. Who were the Nephilim in the Bible? The word Nephilim is found in the Bible two times. Really? 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 Well, okay. You have a Strong's Concordance for the authorized version of the Scriptures? You're not going to find Nephilim in the Scriptures. But note that right there, and the link for this will be in the description box. Um... The word Nephilim is found in the Bible two times. Two times. Not in the scriptures. In a Bible, maybe. Maybe. But in the scriptures, no. Well, that's what it says in the Hebrew. Uh, we have the preserved, perfect, and there given a, by inspiration word of God in English to be translated into other tongues. And we have the English. That's the final purification. Okay? Up to seven times for the word of God. Okay? It's English. And you use this transfer, uh, to um, translate into other tongues. You don't go back to the Hebrew, which one, or the Greek, which one. Okay? That's a lie. That's a lie. Nephilim does not appear in the scriptures. Okay? But this, this is the, the, the launching part for this heretical teaching of the Nephilim. The word Nephilim is found in the Bible two times. That's a lie. Maybe in an NIV or an ESV, but in the scriptures, that's a lie. It is if the first is in Genesis 6, 1 through 6, and that's the that's where they all go for this. And then again in Numbers 13, uh, 33, which we're not going to address because we don't need to. Okay? Now let's let's scroll down here. Alright? We know from Genesis 6, 4 that Nephilim were the offsprings of the son of, sons of God and the daughters of men. This is true. When we discuss the details about the Nephilim in Christian circles today, there is always disagreement. Is there a correct answer to who actually were the Nephilim? Yes! Scholars and theologians find this subject fascinating and scholars theologians you know you go to a modern cemetery school the one book that they are all against is the authorized version of the scriptures just like the bibles that come out they they're a revision or an update of what the authorized version of the scriptures see you want proof that this is the inspired given by inspiration word of god uh, looking at the attacks that come from it, from the Jesuit-trained tra uh, textual critics, scholars, and theologians. Okay? They're Jesuit-trained. Yea, hath God said. Okay? Come from the Jesuits. All right? That includes Mr. Moody of today, the Dallas Theological Seminary, that that wicked master's seminary by that uh, Mason uh, MacArthur, okay? Yeah, scholars and theologians, scholar, trained by Jesuits. Nephilim, fallen angels or giants? The word Nephilim is found in the Bible two times. That's a lie. The first is in Genesis 6, 1 through 6. And then again in Numbers 13, 33, scholars and commentators translate the word Nephilim as giants or fallen ones. Even among the most brilliant, there is debate on translating this term. Okay? One reason Nephilim is often translated as fallen ones is the relation to the Hebrew word nafal, to fall. One school of thought associates these beings with fallen angels or their offspring. Genesis 6, 1 through 6 never states that Nephilim were giants. This is true. We're going to look at this in the scriptures. But it does say they were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Yes, that is true. The verses that clue us into them being giants is Numbers 13, 13. Which is... After the 
flood. After the flood. Yeah. After the flood. Uh -huh. Yeah, more on that in a bit. Which states, and there, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Ankh. That's not from the scripture, okay? And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Here scripture indicates they were possibly giants, men larger and bigger than normal. Let's look in Numbers 13, 33. Okay, Numbers 13. We're going to dive into Genesis 6, 1 on to verse 7. Okay, but Numbers chapter 13, and Numbers chapter 13, of course, a uh, very good chapter, but the verse is 33. And there, there we saw in the scriptures, from the scriptures, and there we saw the giants, the sons of An, which were come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. Now, they might want to tell you that the Greek or the Hebrew word is Nephilim. I don't care what the Hebrew word is. This is the complete, perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration word of God for us today, written in English, to be translated into other tongues from the English, the authorized version. Okay? Yea, hath God said. I believe in a perfect set of scriptures, the authorized version. Scholars and theologians don't. It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay? Now let's continue. No one really knows exactly who or what the Nephilim, who or were, no one really knows exactly who or what were the Nephilim. However, Scripture, what? Scripture never uses the word Nephilim. Scripture gives us clues about who the sons of God and the daughters of men were. They were angels. Bloop. They were angels. More on that in a minute. Who are the Nephilim? Four different theories. For centuries, scholars from Judaism and Christianity. Christianity? Yeah. Christianity? Yeah. Catholic! <laughs> have presented different views on who the Nephilim were. Number one, the first view is that fallen angels had relations with the daughters of men, which resulted in part human, part supernatural being the Nephilim. That I agree with. The second position held by some is that demons or fallen angels possessed men, then had relations with the daughters of men, resulting in the Nephilim. That I do not agree with, and we will look at that uh, here in a little bit. The angels. Angels. Okay. Whether they were fallen angels, I don't know. But they were actual angelic beings. More on that in a bit. Third, a third position called the Shethite view is held by some scholars. The Shethite view defines the sons of God as the righteous line of Seth. No. No. No, no, no. And for lastly, a view held by the minority is the sons of God were simply fallen men. Okay, and let's see how much uh, how much more um, do we have here to go on this? The link for this will be oh, why are the Nephilim on Earth after the flood? There is no proof. There is no proof. Okay, there is no proof that the Nephilim were here after the flood. Okay. There's no proof. The link for this will be in the description box for you to look at yourself and to ponder, okay? So now, that does it for that. Now we're going to get to the scripture, okay? That does it for that. All right. Hello. Now, let's get to scripture. Now, like I said, the link for that will be in the description box for you to look at yourself. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 in your authorized version of the scripture. Okay. Genesis chapter 6. 
There are those that believe that the Nephilim are alive today and that uh, the Satan has uh, the Nephilim DNA and that the New World Order people are the Nephilim and that uh, the, this, this insane idea of the lizard people, shapeshifters, are of the Nephilim, a superhuman type of race. Also, there are theories about that's what Hitler had uh, with the super soldier thing, that they had a strand of the Nephilim DNA. When you look into this nonsense about the Nephilim, it, it, it gets pretty crazy. Like I mentioned, the super soldier thing. There are things out there that you can find that say that Hitler had a strand of Nephilim DNA and tried to create the super soldier from the Nephil Nephilim DNA and stuff like that. And that these, um, uh, you know, steal the Jesuit uh, punyard babies that uh, come today that look like aliens and something like that. That they have a strand of the Nephilim DNA and the, it's... What? <sighs> Yea, hath God said. See, you take the scriptures away from people. This, this kind of nonsense is what comes. Okay? Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 under verse 7. Follow me along. Okay? You're, you're a supporter of this Nephilim nonsense? Hopefully this will persuade you otherwise. Today is the 26th. The fool's proverb. But anyway. Verses 1 on to verse 7 in Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now the sons of God. Now the sons of God, which is also mentioned in verse 4 here. Hold your place here and go to the book of Job. Job, I personally believe, was written before the flood. Absolutely, I believe that. There's no mention of the law of Moses or anything like that. They were, he was doing sacrifices, but um, he was choosing to do sacrifices because they weren't in the law yet. Okay? But, Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay? The sons of God. Who are the sons of God in this context? Angels. Today we are sons of God by adoption. Okay? Yes, we are sons and daughters of God. Yes, we are by adoption. But here in Genesis and also in the book of Job, the sons of God here are being talked about are angels. Okay? And Job chapter 2, verse 1. Verse 1, same thing. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Satan also is the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay? He's a angelic being. Okay? So the sons of God, and here in this, are angels. So what does this tell us about angels? You have from Catholicism... That angels are cherubims, are fat little overdeveloped babies with wings. No, no. Angels, number one, are male. Oh, yeah, I know that might offend a lot of you um, feminazis out there. Especially if you ever watched that stupid Touched by an Angel, which women, angel, no. Angels are male. Okay? There is that in, what is that, um, uh, Zechariah, where you read about the women who had wings like a stork uh, and stuff like that. Okay? All right? They weren't angels. All right? Angels are male, and apparently angels can have relations with women, meaning that angels have male reproductive organs really 
There's also this idea that angels are the sex, sexless or homorphodite thing having both organs. So apparently the sons of God could have relations with the daughters of men. Okay? Yeah. Well, what about the succubi, Brad? The succubi? Oh, the female uh, demons that supposedly uh, give do things to men sexually in their dreams and their sleep? Yeah, as God said, succubi, you don't find that in Scripture. Okay? Does that kind of stuff happen? Yes, it does. But, no. Angels... Our male. Live with it. Okay? But let's continue. And the Lord said, My lowercase s, spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years, and right there is when the Lord gave the lifespan limit onto man. That didn't happen! Right away, it happened gradually, where the lifespan of man started to dwindle dramatically, where Adam lived for almost a thousand years. Okay, right there, he set the time limit for the life of man, and he, that started to depreciate. You were to read on, this is the case, okay? Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. Giants. Giants. Big people. Okay? Big people. As a lost man, I met that wrestler, or lost boy, excuse me. I met the professional wrestler, The Undertaker, Mark Callis. Big guy. Big guy. Had I looked at, and looked up in his, and saw his nose hairs and stuff like that. Okay? Big guy. Okay? Big guy. Does giant here refer to someone who is five stories tall or something like that? No, not necessarily. More on that in a little bit. Okay? But look at this verse. Look at the verse. Look at it. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, hold on, hold on now, also and also after that, that article where it said that uh, Nephilims are supposedly some think that are giants and, they, and even in that article said that they're not. No, these uh, so-called Nephilim were not giants. Uh, look at the verse. There were giants in the earth in those days. They were already there. And also after that, after what? There were already giants present. There were already giants present. Okay? And also after that, that is key, when the sons of God, angels, came in unto the daughters of men. So there were giants there first, before the sons of God went and lay and mate with the daughters of men. Okay? 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 Get it? You don't look at look at the verse. Look at the verse. The giants were there first, and also after that. After what? After, there were giants already there. There were giants already there. And also after that, when the sons of God, angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So there were already giants there. The so-called Nephilim, the offspring of angels and men, okay, the uh, offspring of angels and men, were mighty men which were of old, men of renown. They weren't giants, that's for sure. But they were mighty men, men of renown. Okay? Now let's continue. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that hasn't changed today, by the way. It hasn't. 
Okay. And it repented the Lord, he regretted. Well, let's look at the verse. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him. Grief, repented, grief, repented, okay? Repentance, there is grief involved in repentance, okay? God is not a sinner, you idiot. And I mean that with love, because people who are against the scripture, it's like, well, what, God needed to repent? <laughs> no, no, he regretted that he had made man. It grieved him that he had made man. God needs no repentance. God never sinned. God can't sin, okay? But it grieved him that he had made man on the earth. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, this is key, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And let's read verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now in the description box, again, there will be that video uh, link for the serpent seed doctrine. I believe wholeheartedly that the line of Cain, the line of Cain, was extinguished in the flood. Okay? Some like to argue, well, we don't know about Noah's wives, if they were of the lineage of Cain or of Seth. We don't know. We don't know. I believe that the line, the bloodline of Cain perished in the flood. Okay? And I believe we, we talk about that in the Serpent Seed Doctrine video. I believe we do. I believe we do. I th I, I'm pretty sure we do. Uh, check that out. But the line of Cain perished died in the flood. And of course, the heresy of the serpent seed doctrine that Shepherd's Chapel teaches that the uh, Kenites are the continued line of Cain or something like that, okay? Then that would mean that Cain's bloodline was on the ark. And you do the research, Noah stemmed from Seth, okay? There is no Zero scriptural evidence. None. Zip. Zero. Nada. No evidence whatsoever to suggest that Noah was one of these offspring of uh, angels and men. That is something that I have heard also, that Noah was one of these so-called Nephilim. There ain't no proof of that whatsoever. If you get that, you get it from something apocryphal, which is not inspired scripture. There is no proof, no evidence whatsoever that suggests that Noah was a so-called Nephilim. Actually, there is evidence that Noah is descended from Shem. He was a man. Okay? All right? There's no proof. No proof of that. No proof whatsoever, okay? Now, let's go to Job chapter 16. Let's get, let's touch a little on this, this thing about the giants, okay? Now, the flood happened, okay? The line of Cain extinguished. These offspring of angels and men also perished, okay? Giants. The giants were there before before, before the sons of God had relations with the daughters of men. Okay, we just looked at it. Okay, so these offspring of angels and men were not the giants. They weren't. Okay, they weren't. All right, but go to Job chapter 16 now. Job chapter 16. We're going to be reading verses 11 on to verse 14. Okay, and I believe, like I said at the beginning of this video, that Job is before the flood. Is before the flood. And we're going to see that giants, after the flood, are really tall people. Not people who were 18 stories high, like uh, the Greek um, uh, myth of titans and stuff like that. Okay? We're going to see that, uh, for example, Og. 
King of Bashan was probably somewhere about a 10 to 12 foot tall guy. Pretty big. Pretty big. Well, that made a great NBA player. Okay? All right? And also that we will see that Goliath, and this is how the Lord showed me about the error with the six finger thing, because looking into this, it's like, oh, it wasn't Goliath. Okay? Goliath was up anywhere between 9 to 10 feet tall. Okay? 9 to 10 feet tall. Have you ever come across someone who was close to actual 7 foot tall? And you're like 5'8 or 5'7 or something like that? You know, my height? And he's like, wow, that's pretty gigantic, isn't it? But I want us to look here in Job chapter 16, verses 11 on to verse 14. Job uses the word giant as a figure of speech. How so? Let's look. Job chapter 16, verses 11 on to verse 14. Remembering all that Job went through. Job in the beginning parts of the book of Job, and one, two, three, four, and one fell swoop had everything taken away from him except his wife. <laughs> Who also lost with her husband. Because those were also her children that died. Okay, you got to remember that. You got to remember that about Job's wife. But Job went through a lot of stuff. So Job's problems, which there were no basis for them to have happened. You read the first couple of chapters of Job. The Lord shows us this. Um, Job's problems and sufferings were gigantic, weren't they? Job 16, 11 on to verse 14. God hath delivered me to the ungodly, and turned me over on, into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck, and shaken me to pieces, and set me up for his mark. You know, in the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, there is, um, John Bunyan makes mention of the giant of despair. The giant despair. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. His archers compass me up round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant, like a giant. Job uses this as a figure of speech. Look at that, what he just describes. And think about what Job was going through and his three friends who opened up their big mouth and accused Job. Okay? Job's problems were definitely gigantic, weren't they? So when he says here, he breaketh me with breach upon breach, he runneth upon me like a giant. That's a figure of speech. His problems were gigantic, were they not? Were they not? Okay? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. He uses it as a figure of speech. So giant is a really big dude. Okay? Now, let's go to Numbers 13. Okay? Uh, I was wrong. I, I wrote it down here. Numbers 13. Let's go back to there. After the flood. After the flood, the whole earth was overspread by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that is where the base of the kindreds come from, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It is not this impossible, unfathomable thing that a man could grow in those times um, to the height of 10 to even 12 feet. Even in modern times in the 1900s, there were guys who got up to uh, 12 feet tall. They had all kinds of problems and whatnot. But also, too, you've got to remember, immediately after the flood and the overspreading of the sons of Noah to repopulate the earth, um, the gene pool, pool still, at that time, was more so pure than it is now. Okay? Okay? It was after the flood, the climate and everything changed after the flood, okay? After the flood, everything changed. Climate, uh, soil, 
man, you know, that, because of the flood, grapes fermented a lot quicker. And Noah then got drunk, okay? We talk about that in What Was Ham's Real Sin, okay? Which, if I remember, will be in the description box for you, okay? Everything changed after the flood. But see, the gene pool was still more pure, a lot more pure than it is from today. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. One second, please. So, see, brethren, we're going to see that after the flood, it's not this impossible thing for someone with a more pure gene pool at that time, too. It's not this thing impossible where you need divine intervention for someone to reach the height that some of these guys did. Okay? It's, it's not some kind of supernatural. It's not something where Satan himself got involved or the... <laughs> This Nephilim DNA, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Okay? But, Numbers chapter 13, verses 26 on to verse 33. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And this is the land of Canaan that they're talking about. This is where Moses sends out, uh, at the command of the Lord, sends uh, people out to uh, search out the land of Canaan, for their conquest, and also to try to see where their heart was, whether they were going to trust in the Lord. A lot on this we can talk about, but we're talking about a specific thing here about uh, the giants, okay? Yeah. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, yea, hath God said, but, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Ank, the Anakims, Anakims or Ankims, whatever, the children of Ank there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. Now, if this were the sons of Ankh, if these were uh, uh, related to the offspring of the angels and men, then that means that one of these offspring or something was on the ark. And there, the argument goes to, well, we don't know about their wives. Okay? This is true. This is true. But see, we're, as we're going to see here in the close, in the previous video, I had made mention that, um, is it possible for today, today, that an angel can have relations with, a woman. Is it possible? In the previous video, I said, yeah, yeah, perhaps that is. I don't know. But we're going to see later in 2 Peter chapter 2 that the angels that lay with mankind, with the women of mankind, and produced these children were held in chains, reserved unto judgment. So, that begs the question. Will an angel today lie with a daughter of man? Is it possible? Maybe. But we're going to see that if such were to happen, it would be devastating for that angel. And also, the offspring thereof would probably not survive. We probably not survive. And plus two, we don't have any other occurrence 
other than before the flood of such a thing happening. Is it possible? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Is it probable? No. No. No, it isn't. Because like I said, it would be very costly for that angel and the offspring would probably die. But let's continue. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 29, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that, were, that we saw in it are men of great stature, big guys. And there we saw the, the giants, the sons of Ankh, which come of the giants, big people, not these super race of half angel, half men. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were, were we in their sight. Yeah, you look up at a tall guy, it's like, hey, you got a booger in your nose. You know? Okay? All right. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Okay? And this is after the flood. Like I said, are there... Any, are there breeds of people today walking around that are half angel, half men? No. 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 Is it possible? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But we don't see any other occurrence of it in Scripture. Like I said, and we're going to see the consequences of such. There would, would be nothing. I mean, it would... Mm. So are there angel, half angel, half men breed of people, you know, the reptilian people, the shapeshifters, or the people who are running the New World Order. Are, no. No. Or the, um, the um, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, pandemic babies, right? They're part Nephilim DNA? No. 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 Nonsense. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 9 on to verse 11. Okay? And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. Moab and the Ammonites are the descendant of Lot, a uh, Lot who had an incestuous relation with his daughters. Okay? And it tells you within the verse that Moab is of Lot. Okay? The Emims dwelt there in times past. The, the Emims dwelt therein in times past. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. Okay? Tall people. Okay? Not the super duper race of being, kindred of being, that's half angel and half men. Mighty men, men of renown. Okay? Those died in the flood. There are not Nephilim walking around today. Okay? There aren't. Let's continue. Which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. Okay? And let's skip a little to verses 17 on to verse 21 now. Okay? Uh, let's know 16 on verse 21 in Deuteronomy chapter 2 still. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, the 40 years of uh, wilderness uh, wandering, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, Ammon, Lot, okay, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. Ammon and Moab. It tells you right there where Ammon and Moab descend from. Lot, 
the incestuous relationship between him and his daughters. Okay? That also... Excuse me. That also was accounted a land of giants. Big people. Not ten-story high people. No. Big, tall people. Twelve to anywhere to 12 to 15 feet tall, okay? Grappler would have one of them down in no time. <laughs> All that leg, but anyway. That also was a, accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in an old time. And the Ammonites called them Zamzumzims, a people great and many and tall, as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them, them before them, and they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead. Okay? Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 3. And here's where we're going to get a little technical with stuff, okay? Talking about some of the height of these people, okay? They weren't ten stories tall, like some of these nitwits who fall for the stuff from the Book of Enoch, okay? It's not like that, all right? Giants were big people, not 10 to 15 feet, uh, not 10 to 20 feet tall. Now, before the flood, we don't have an exact uh, numbering on what the height of these giants were. Also, you got to remember, before the flood, the world was totally different, okay? Totally different, totally different, okay? Could there have been a 20 foot tall giant before the flood? Yes. Yes. Could there have been a 90 foot? The length from home, bay, a home plate to first base. 90 feet. Could there have been a 90 foot tall giant before the flood? Yes. Yes. Probably. Because you got to remember, the atmosphere was different. The atmosphere was different. 90 feet from home base to first base. Okay? That's 90 feet. Okay, that's baseball jargon for those of you of other nations you don't know. Okay, but 90 feet tall. Could there have been a 90 foot tall uh, giant before the flood? Sure, sure, absolutely. 20 story, 10 story tall, like the Greek myth uh, mythology of the Titans? As tall as the Sears Tower? No, 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 okay, no. All right. We don't know before the flood, but as far as the giants that we are talking about, we're going to see, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 13. This is talking about Og, and you also can read about Og in the book of Joshua, okay? Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to the battle of Edri. And also, too, um, not much is mentioned of giants after, for example, the book of Joshua. And also in uh, 2 Samuel, which we're going to look at, and in Chronicles and stuff like that, where it talks about giants as well. Okay? All right? And in the book of Revelation, I'm sorry, people. Those of you last day guys who get pretty, pretty silly about this, um... The Nephilim, these race of angels and men, they don't return. Okay? All right, let's continue. The Lord said unto me, Fear not, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Shion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Threescore cities, all the region of Argub, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, beside unwalled towns a great many. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did unto Shion, king of Hezbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves. 
And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side Jordan from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians call Sirion, and the Amorites called it Shinir. All the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan unto Salcha and Edri, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, right here, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits, and we're going to look into this, nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. More on this in a bit. And this land which we possessed at that time from Error, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Okay? Now, looking at verse 11. Okay? For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants, not the remnant from the flood, because remember, only eight souls made it out of the flood. Okay? And there ain't no evidence at all that says Noah was one of those breed between angels and men. If you get that, you got it from the apocryphal, one of these apocryphal books, which is not inspired scripture. Okay? That's a yea hath God said, given to you from Satan to confuse you, and God is not the author of confusion. Okay? But, behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of, of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Now, what an actual cubit is varies. Because it says there a cubit according to a man, uh, after the cubit of a man. Roughly, roughly what we can surmise is that a cubit was anywhere between 1.5 and 1.6 feet. What that is in kilometers, you who know math, you figure that one out. We here in America and also in England, uh, not, uh, I'm not sure, but he, we here in America, we use feet. Okay, in other nations you don't, you figure that one out for yourself, okay? But roughly a cubit was 1.5 foot, something from elbow to this digit, something like that, roughly. We surmise that. So, okay, now if you do the math of what uh, nine cubits, at, and we went, we go, let's do 1.5, okay? That comes out to be a nine cubit side length bed was anywhere between 13.5 foot or 14 feet long. Okay? Now, most beds, you get a bed bigger than yourself. Don't you? Okay? I'm what? 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, My bed, uh, I think, is something like almost six foot something, maybe seven. I don't know. But... My bed is longer than I, okay? You get a bed, and you are usually shorter than your bed, right? Right? Okay? So, uh, Oak's bed was anywhere roughly between 13.5 and 14 feet long, okay? So, are we to surmise, is that how tall Oak was? Most beds, most beds, even in ancient times, were bigger than the person that they would uh, that would lay on them. Most of them, because well, if you're six foot and you try to lay down on a four foot bed, boy, you're gonna have some cramps in the morning, boy. <laughs> okay, so let's logically think if. Og was taller, bigger than his bed. That wouldn't probably fit him or be good for him, would it? 
And it says here that it was four cubits, the breadth of it, four cubits wide. And four cubits wide roughly is about what? Six feet length, taller than me, okay? So the length of Oak's bed, let's say my twin, I have a twin bed uh, here in uh, uh, Brother Alexander's room. Um, we Let's say this is six foot. Okay, it's bigger than six foot, but let's just say it's six foot. So Oak's bed was six foot uh, wide by anywhere from 13.5 to 14 feet long. Okay? A big bed made for a big man. So we can guesstimate, okay, it wouldn't make sense if Oak was 20 feet tall and he had, say, only a 14 foot bed. That, that, that guy would be a cripple. Okay, the guy would be a cripple, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, you can't stretch out. There's a verse in scripture, uh, brother, uh, help with in the description box, if you would, where the bed is uh, shorter than a man can uh, stretch himself out on. I, 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 I didn't write that down, but brother, help me with that. Okay, but yeah, if you're going to have a bed shorter than yourself. Boy, I wouldn't want to be you in the morning waking up with the crink in your neck or the crink in your hips or something. So let's say that Og was a little smaller than his bed. How big was he? I don't know. I guess that Og was anywhere between 10 to 12 feet tall. That's a big boy. Like I said, he would have made a killing in the NBA. <laughs> okay? But Anywhere between 10 to 12 feet tall. Now, was that a divine act of God that came like a miraculous, powerful thing that he miraculously made this guy 10 that big? Or was it just something happened because, number one, the gene pool was far more pure after the flood. And even in this time, the gene pool was still more pure, but yet degrading with time and intermingling and stuff like that. Okay? It's not that far from the imagination. To attribute Og's height of anywhere between 10 to 12 feet tall to some race of being that I believe was extinguished in the flood, that's crazy. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. It is not a miraculous thing that in these times there were people that like Og that made it to 10 to 12 feet tall. Okay? Even in modern times, there are records of guys who made it to 10 to 12 feet tall also. Uh, I remember there was some young man in Africa who was lanky and bony that made it to something like, what, 11 feet tall? Something like that? It's not an uncommon thing. It's not a supernatural thing where God's like, hallelujah, or some nonsensical thing about Nephilim DNA. It's nonsense. Og. It's just a really big dude. Okay? Okay? Now, let's go to 2 Samuel. Now, this is also echoed in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, which we are not going to be looking at. We are going to be sticking with 2 Samuel. Where are you going, Bray? 2 Samuel. Beg your pardon. Had grits for breakfast today. You needed to know that. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. We want verses 15 on to verse 22. 15 on to verse 22. Okay? Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. Now, in the comment section of the Lost Tribes, I make reference to this, what we're going to look at. And it was in this, looking this up, where the Lord's like, eh, Brad, you made an error in the last video attributing to Goliath the six finger and six toes thing. Okay, This is this portion of scripture. And I, 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 at the beginning of this video, I admitted to it. I did it in the, 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 the what, that community thing. I did it in the comment section. Okay? Hey, I make mistakes sometimes, but I correct them and I leave them up so you can see. Okay, let's continue. 
Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down, and his servants with him, and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Beno, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abiashai, the son of Zariah, succored him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. Okay? And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, well, uh, where Elhanan, the son of Jeri Orgum, Orgum, Orgium, excuse me, Jeri Orgium, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Have you ever seen a weaver's beam? They're, they're huge. They're pretty big. Okay. Goliath had a brother. And Bibles question this because it's in italics. So what? Goliath lived and died twice? No, the brother of Goliath. Okay. And there was yet a battle in Gath. Where, and here it is. Where was a man of great stature. Great stature. No significant, no significant saying that he was a giant, but of great stature. Okay? What does that mean? Don't know. Let's read. That had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. You know how some people like to get be smart Alexes and say, how many fingers am I holding up? Uh, four and a thumb. Scripture says right there, six fingers. So I know it's cute. We like to say, be smart, Alex's. Say, how many fingers am I holding up? Four and a thumb. <laughs> Scripture right there counts all of these as fingers. Okay? A little thing there. Just, just saying. And it was a man, uh, what was, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Four and twenty in number. And right here, he and he also was born to the giants. Okay? So right there it is. So in the beginning, great stature. No uh, attributing the giant, right? But then it says, and he also was born to the giant. So yes, this guy who had six fingers and six toes was born to the giant. So he was great. He was of great stature. It says he was born to the giant, born to the giant, but it says great stature. Hmm. But he's the one, whoever this was, had six fingers and six toes, not Goliath. Okay. Now let's continue. And when he defied Israel, jo Jonathan the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, Gath of the Philistines, and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Okay? All right? So we see giants also attributed with the Philistines and stuff like that. Okay? And like I said, the guy who had six fingers and six toes on every hand and foot wasn't Goliath. He was of the Philistines, obviously, but he wasn't Goliath. Okay? Now, let's go to 1 Samuel. And what we just read is also echoed in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 4 and verse 8. We're not going to go there, okay? But now let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're almost done. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We want verses 4 and 7. Talking about Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verses 4 on to verse 7. And there went out a champion 
out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. What is a span? I didn't look that up. I don't know. But six cubits. Six cubits is anywhere between nine to 9.5 feet tall, maybe even up to 10 feet tall. Okay? So, Goliath obviously was a big guy, anywhere between 9 to 10 feet tall. That span thing, I didn't look up what a span was, but the cubit, it says 9 cubits and a span. So, anywhere between 9 to 9.5 to 10 feet tall, that's how tall Goliath was. Okay? So, in comparison to Og, whose bed was anywhere to from 13.5 uh, to 14 feet in length, and six feet in width, okay, I believe that Goliath was comparable in height to O, king of Bashan, or Bashan, excuse me, okay? But yes, Goliath, he was a big boy, anywhere between nine to ten feet tall, okay? Let's continue. Okay, uh, where I just lost, uh, just lost my place. Okay, okay. Verse five, and he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Okay? So Goliath, Goliath was a giant. Anywhere between 9 to 10 feet tall. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he's a big boy. He was a big boy. And of course, David took a smooth stone, slung stone, hit him right, uh, dotted his eye, and he fell forward. Forward. Face down. Plunk. And then, okay? So that's about the giants. Giants were... Anywhere, could have been anywhere between 12 to 10 to 12 feet tall uh, before the flood. Um, who knows? They could have been 90 foot tall. Could they have been as tall as a skyscraper? I doubt it. No, I doubt it. I doubt it. But see, that's not the argument. That's not the argument. The argument about these this Nephilim thing is that they're either giants or they're, they're, they're like some super duper uh, half breed uh, race running around here, the ones that are controlling everything. No, 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 no. The Nephilim were, uh, were destroyed in the flood. And Nephilim doesn't even appear in scripture. Okay? But these Nephilim, so called, were destroyed in the flood. Second Peter chapter 2. Here is the very good counter-argument to the idea that these things are walking around today or will be walking around in the future. Because that's one of the arguments with people who get messed up with the Book of Enoch and all these crazy apocryphal books uh, is that the, the super race of angel and man is going to reappear during the time of Jacob's trouble or they're the ones who are running the Illuminati and stuff like that and that's what the those at the uh, Bohemian Grove worship or all this kind of crazy nonsense. It's nonsense. But here is a good argument against the possibility that a half angel, half man thing is around today or will be. Okay? Is it a possibility that some rogue angel can go ahead and lay with a daughter of men today? Is it possible? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But what do we do with this? Second Peter chapter 2, just two verses. Verses 4 and 5. Talking about the flood and before the flood. And for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Okay? Colon. Continuing the thought in the uh, uh, sentence. Or semicolon, excuse me. One of the two. I get confused on that. 
But this is a continuation of the thought. Okay, it's not the end thereof. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we see verse 4 about the angels of that sin and cast down to hell and delivered into change, chains, and then we read about the flood and the world being destroyed. Now, there were angels that took the side of Lucifer. Yes. Okay. Because, like Lucifer, a created being, okay, they were proudful, pride, and they didn't want to serve God anymore and wanted to be against God. But also, I believe this is in reference to those angels that went and lie with the daughters of men and produced that race of breed, half-breed of angel and man, which erroneously referred to as the Nephilim, which is not referred to as Nephilim within the authorized version of the scriptures. The angels that did that were cast to hell and reserved in chains. Are, are putting chains to be chains to be reserved on to judgment. That judgment, of course, the great white throne, where Satan himself is going to be cast into the lake of fire. All sin is going to be eradicated at the great white throne of judgment because it's all going to be cast into the lake of fire. No more sin, and then the seventh and final dispensation, no sin, eternity. So, Second Peter chapter two, verses four and five are a really good argument against the uh, possibility that today there are these breed of half angel, half men walking around controlling things or that there will be during the time of Jacob's trouble there is no scriptural evidence to suggest that. The only way that comes about is when you got people trying to mix this nonsense. Interesting, yes. This non-inspired stuff with inspired scripture. That's what happens when you get messed up with this kind of stuff, people. Okay? So, and uh, what about the Watchers, too? The Watchers. The, 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 the Book of Enoch makes a big to-do about the Watchers. What about the Watchers, okay? Watchers, go to Jeremiah. Chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 4. There are also the watchers that the watchers are a specific um, uh, class of angels, even more greater than the cherubims or seraphims or sephirims or, or one of our just right under archangel, these watchers. That, hey, these Nephilim, they're watchers too, right? Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. See, this is you know, another thing. There was watchers. Okay? The watchers. I know that devil uh, Burton C. Bell and his satanic filth band, Ascension of the Watchers, which is inspired by the apocryphal books. Okay? Knit with devil twit. I reached out to that guy, tried to, to witness to him, but he's, he's, you know, too much of a superstar. Stupid idiot that he is. Okay? But, uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse uh, 16. Um, let's see. Let's read verses um, 14 on to verse 17. Is that a period? Yes. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Who? Dan and Ephraim. The two tribes that are not mentioned, uh, uh, that are sealed during the time of Jacob's trouble. Those two tribes? Dan and Ephraim? Wow, interesting, huh? Yeah. Make ye mention to the nations. Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers are come from a far country, okay? This is the first appearance of watchers, okay? Watchers in their entirety appears, what is it? One, two, three, 
four in its entirety. Two of watchers and two of watcher. Okay? And the plural, once again, appears before the singular. Okay? But let's continue. Verse 16. Make ye mention to the nations. Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field are they against her round about. Because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Now verse 16. Watchers from a far country. What is that talking about? Spies. Spies from Babylon. Okay? Not angelic beings of another class of angel where you have to go to an apocryphal book to understand the significance of a watcher okay that's nonsense right there watchers from a far country it's men and they're, they're spies okay that's what that is now let's go to daniel chapter four daniel chapter four where we're going to read the majority of this watcher and watchers okay Daniel chapter 4. And Daniel chapter 4 is a beautiful chapter. Absolutely beautiful. Let's see. Let's see. Where do we begin? Okay. Nebuchadnezzar telling Daniel his dream because the Lord said, Hey, you're a little too cocky. And the Lord humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And the Nebuchadnezzar knew that the Lord was God. And hence it is because of Daniel chapter 4 that I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven. Absolutely. But let's let's begin here um, at verse 10. We're going to read on to verse so, 18. But there's also a reference uh, in verse 23. But that's Daniel reciting what uh, Nebuchadnezzar said. Let's read actually verses 8 on to verse 18. Okay, about these watchers, get okay? watcher guys, okay? But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my little G God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, all lowercase. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew, and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the ends of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. And the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof. And all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed. And behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. Okay? A watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. Okay? He cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from him under it and the fowls from his branches. Now this watcher and an holy one. Okay? This is not two different individuals. This is one and the same. Okay? So an holy one came down from heaven. So yes, obviously, this is some sort of angelic being. But see, watcher is not in and of itself a class of angelic being. Okay? Because this watcher was doing what? Obviously, watching and declaring what was going to happen. Okay? That is all. Alright? That is all. All right, similar to watchmen. They see, and then they go and declare what they see coming. Okay? All right? See, 
the Book of Enoch and some of these guys who use this nonsensical stuff about Nephilim and Watchers, they turn Watchers into something more pronounced than they actually are. This Watcher, yes, he was obviously an Holy One and he came down from heaven. Yes, yes. But was he like right, uh, just as almost as powerful as an archangel or more greater than the uh, cherub or sephirims? Like it's a, its own class of angel? No, no, no. Let's continue. He cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the beasts in the grass, with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, plural. Okay? So these watchers, okay angelic beings surveying the land and then speaking these things what they have saw and what the, they declare from the Lord okay the Lord kind of like kind of like the equivalent of a prophet in a way because they see what's going on and then they are given things to say okay all right all right but is this its own class of angelic being? No. There's no proof in this to say that the watchers are like, okay, here's Archangel, here are watchers, here are uh, Cherub, uh, Sephirim. No. No. Watchers, this is what they are doing. Not a class of angel. Okay? All right? A watcher. It's a noun. Watching is a verb. Watcher, watch, uh, watcher, someone who watches, watchers, some peoples who watch. It's a noun, okay? Okay, it's not its own class of angel, okay? All right, all right, and note where this appears, all right? It appears in context onto Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Note that, watchers, Watcher does not appear in the book of Revelation. It doesn't. Okay? Watchmen and stuff like that are elsewhere in Scripture. This is not its own class of angel, dear friend. Okay? You're getting that from this. This is not inspired Scripture. And you're going off of this, trying to interpret Scripture... You, you're, you're going off in all the wrong directions, dear friend. Sure, I, I got a copy of it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not scripture. It can't be trusted. And this watcher thing? This is not inspired scripture. Okay? Verse 17. This matter is, is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. Okay? All right? This dream I have, this dream I king Nebuchadnezzar have seen. Now therefore, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And of course, the final reference, verse 23, where Daniel is just reciting. Okay? Well, let's read verses 22 and 23, and then we'll be done. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, 
hew the tree down and destroy it. The watcher is basically a messenger. Okay? A messenger. Okay? That's it. All right? Gabriel uh, delivered a message, a message. Was he called a watcher? Hmm? Gabriel, was he referred to as a watcher? He delivered a message to uh, Joseph, didn't he? Hmm? Yeah. Watcher is not a specific class of angel. Okay? All right. Because if it were, then what, what was Gabriel? Was he, or Gabriel, was he, um, was he a watcher? Was he ever attributed the title of a watcher? No. But he declared, didn't he? Yeah. A watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This, and, this is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the King. Decree from the Most High, Lord God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. So this watcher just relayed a message, okay? Kind of like what Gabriel did. Gabriel, excuse me, did. But yet, he was never accounted a, a watcher, was he? So see, these apocryphal books take something like a watcher and make it into this glorious, grandiose thing which Scripture doesn't. Okay? Got to be careful. People, you have to really be careful when it comes to these apocryphal books. You don't go to the book of Enoch to interpret scripture. Nor do you go to the keys of science and health according to the scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy to interpret the scripture. You don't go to the catechism which has the Revised Standard Version as its uh, biblical base, you don't go to the Catechism to interpret Scripture. You don't go to a commentary. You don't go to the institutes of the uh, Christian religion. Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may understand thy truth. Okay, you as lost people, you can buy all these uh, apocryphal books and get all this weird stuff. If you're not saved, you don't have the spirit of truth, and the Lord is that spirit who would guide you into all truth. So you got to go to this kind of nonsense. Okay, if you are truly saved, born again, converted of the Church of the Living God, the Spirit of Truth, that seal until the day of redemption, the Holy Ghost, He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay, all right. You don't have to go outside of Scripture. To understand scripture. The scripture itself defines itself. But see, the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? And he will show you to rightly divide the word of truth, which is, of course, one of the biggest problems with most of these heretics anyway. And, this, and because of that, you come up with this nonsense about you got to keep the law today or uh, black people are, are the chosen one, white people are the chosen one, you got to be a Jew. And it, it, it's, uh. Anyway, the Nephilim do not exist today, nor do I believe they will ever because of 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The possibility. Okay, is it a possibility? Maybe, yes. I don't know. But according to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, eh, is it possible? Maybe. Is it probable? No, absolutely not. No. A superhuman race, get that? Human, superhuman race, 
the God of you that looks like the aliens that are supposedly whatever, okay? But a superhuman race of half angel and half human? <laughs> That's nonsense. That's nonsense. If you're trying, if you're getting things from scripture by basing them off of apocryphal books, you are in error. You are in great error. This is not inspired scripture. Neither is Sirach, Esdras, the book of Maccabees, the wisdom of Solomon, the prayer of Manasseh, even though that's good. That's not inspired scripture. The shepherd of Hermas, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of, 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 of what's his name? Um, um, oh, I forgot his name. Uh, who went and got Saul. Barnabas. Those aren't inspired scripture. We have the perfect and errant given by inspiration word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures. Yes, this edition has the Apocrypha sandwiched between the two testaments. Yes, but the Old and New Testament, the canon, chosen by God, not by men. But see, when you get these Jesuit trained scholars, well, the Roman Catholics gave us the Bible. Man chose what went in and what didn't. Yea, hath God said? So see, you have that type of mentality, then you're saying God, who promised in Psalm chapter 12, come on, Psalm chapter 12, Psalm chapter 12, God made a promise about his word, okay? So when you come in around saying, well, what is scripture? Why isn't this scripture? When the early church fathers around 364, uh -huh, Catholic, Catholicos, uh -huh, yeah. So God couldn't preserve his word? God couldn't conserve, preserve his word for us today. That's what you're saying. Uh, Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 and 8. Excuse me. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. English is the seventh and final purification of God's word. Okay? Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The them are the words. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. The vilest men, Jesuit trained cemeterians that come out textual, textual critics questioning the authorized version of the scriptures. Yea, hath God said. So, be careful. Be careful be with being taken with this nonsense about Nephilim and the Watchers, and Enoch, and Nephilim, Watchers, and Enoch. Oh, boy. Be careful, brethren. Don't fall for it. Because when you get right to it, this contradicts the Scripture. As does the Apocrypha that is within this uh, copy, this set of the Scriptures. And, you know, like I said, you read the Apocryphal books, that's where you get Catholic doctrine. Okay? So be careful. Be careful. If you want to know what Scripture is saying, you need to be saved. Because if you go to men, stuff like that, it's going to lead you astray. And especially if the man isn't of the church of the living God. Okay? God uses men. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. To preach and to teach. But if you go to a Christian who is not saved, who doesn't have the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit within them, like Catholics, they have God said. So that's going to be it for this video. I'm going to put these two videos together using the, um, the thing there and uh, going to upload this. So thank you so much for watching this. If you do, we love you. Thank you very much for those of you who pray for us um, and help us. Thank you very much. We love you so very much, all of you. Um, 
The next video will most likely be on the other channel. So um, keep an eye out for that, if you will. Thank you for watching this if you do.